we turn our full attention now to Schweikart's analysis of the problem of global poverty. Capitalism is the elephant in the room, as Schweikart puts it. Any analysis of global poverty that doesn't talk about global capitalism is doomed to fail. In Schweikart's analysis, in order to function properly, a capitalist economy requires both a high rate of unemployment and that being unemployed super sucks for the person unemployed. To the first requirement, a capitalist economy requires a significant amount of unemployment. In economics, the term is LSUR or just LSUR, an acronym standing for lowest, sustain lowest sustainable unemployment rate. The LSUR is a sort of basic economic truth of capitalism. Schweigart explains that this, this, this sustainable label here is only in reference to profits, right? It is not an, in, it is not an environmental concern for sustainability. Um, it is about sustaining profit growth. So we can't have unemployment too low because as Schweikart states, quote, if the unemployment rate gets too low, workers get uppity and press for higher wages, which leads to higher prices, more pressure for wage increases, and ultimately runaway inflation, which is bad for all of us, end quote. But uh, capitalism and capitalists want unemployment as low and close to that point as possible since salaries and wages are seen as cutting into profits. And to the second requirement, in, capitalist, in a capitalist economy, unemployment has to suck. As Schweikart puts it, quote, a defining characteristic of capitalism is that the employees of enterprises are distinct from their owners. There, and there must be a mechanism to keep the workforce disciplined, end quote. So the threat of being fired operates as this disciplinary mechanism, but it only works when the resulting unemployment is terrible. Simply put, for capitalism to keep its low wages and salaries, the alternative for an employee has to be much worse than their current working conditions. And further, Globalizing capitalism also tends to dislocate local industries in poorer countries uh, and thus generating low wage work and massive urban unemployment. An estimated 40% of the global unemployment rate is the result of this sort of foreign companies coming into poorer countries to, in order for that company to save costs on wages and then subsequently becoming invested in keeping this country poor so it can continue to benefit from these low wages. Schweigert's argument is that the defining feature of capitalism makes it intrinsically incapable of solving global poverty because, in fact, its nature requires it. So, if Schweigert is right, poverty will never be eliminated as long as capitalism is the dominant economic system in the world. This means that the solution to global poverty will not be simply to redistribute wealth, but will be to establish a new dominant global economy. Certainly no easy feat, but let's take a look at one such new dominant global economy and, and how it might look and how it might work. As Schweikart sees it, people are reluctant to talk about capitalism as a cause of poverty because it is widely assumed that there is no known viable alternative. Schweikart thinks that this assumption is wrong. So he proposes an alternative, the Central Institution of Economic Democracy, or the Worker Managed Company. Um, this as an alternative to the sort of corporation capitalist business model. The main idea here is that in, instead, of, um, instead of a thing someone can own, a business is a community to be governed democratically. Workers elect their managers and have a say on company policies. They receive a share um, of the company's profits instead of a wage. Schweikart argues that economic democracy would be more egalitarian than capitalism while retaining its dynamism and ability to foster innovation. And it would be compatible uh, with full employment, which makes it quite distinct from capitalism. Further, this kind of business model on the global scale would not lead to the dislocation of industries in poorer countries because companies are not under pressure by stockholders to grow and there wouldn't be the same kind of international wage competition, 
competition driving wages down, corporations and companies would no longer be so motivated to outsource jobs um, in order to increase their profit margins, right? And that is sort of the very thing at work in global capitalism. So that's the main idea here behind Schweikart, Schweikart's notion of economic democracy as a viable alternative to global capitalism. It's worth being explicit that whatever my economics are, the reason we read this article in Ethics in Philosophy 103 is because of the reasons stated at the beginning. This article connects ideas and arguments we're examining in our class, and it provides a good example of moral reasoning concerning modern moral problems. Specifically, it provides us an example of how moral reasoning operates in economic and political philosophy. You may want to say that these subjects are separate, but don't let yourself get too comfortable thinking we can neatly divide ethics from other subjects, especially those that have a real impact on our lived lives and our opportunities to live well. While you may ultimately disagree with Schweikart's argument that global capitalism is incompatible with solving global poverty, he does point out realities we can't deny, such as currently there is enough money worldwide to eliminate this problem. And heretofore, philanthropy and reforming trade standards and regulations has not succeeded in eliminating this problem. Schweikart offers a thoughtful, critical perspective on a part of our lives that many of us do not reflect on, namely why the economy is the way it is and how it can be meaningfully different. Philosophers that deal in economics and politics are providing us interesting alternatives to structures that can feel inevitable. Schweikart's proposal of an economic democracy is interesting, thoughtful, realistic, even though it is dramatically different from what we see in the US and much of the world. And we should thus take it seriously, even if we would ultimately reject it for something else. Here we are at the end of this PowerPoint video. Now I want you to take the time for further reflection on the topic and implications of Schweikart's article. Take at least 10 minutes to respond to the following questions. Post your responses to the journal on Blackboard. One. What connections can you draw between Schweikart's philosophical analysis and other philosophers we've studied? For example, Mill, Kant, and Jung. Write at least a paragraph identifying the related points and what connections you think are significant. Two, in the introductory section of the article, Schweikart brings up this idea from Karl Marx that problems appear solvable only once we acquire the means to resolve them. Mankind inevitably sets itself only those tasks it is able to solve. The problem itself arises only when the material conditions for its solution are present, or at least in the course of formation. And Schweiker goes on to identify global poverty as this kind of problem. The urgent practical problem of global poverty has become a problem as opposed to an inescapable part of the human condition, only because material conditions now exist for its eradication. So here's your question to answer. How would you explain this idea in your own words? And do you agree? Why or why not? And third, how do you articulate your moral, your moral responsibility to help solve global poverty in 2021? Do you think you have some responsibility to do something? To be aware, to donate money and or time, to educate yourself, to organize with others via protests, campaigning, canvassing, calling your representatives who can make a global impact, etc. Or do you think you're totally off the hook? Write at least four to six sentences explaining your answer. Once your reflections are complete, post your answers to the journal entry titled April 22 Reflection Cues on Schweikart and Global Poverty. Till next time.